Good evening, everyone. I'm Patrick O'Connell, uh, New World School of the Arts College Class of 1992. And I want to welcome you all to Alumni Live, presented by your New World School of the Arts Alumni Foundation. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, we really appreciate um, all of you joining us, but I particularly want to thank our event producers for this evening, uh, Amy Langer, uh, David Schwartz, and also Luna Goldberg uh, from our board of directors. Um, our moderators tonight, Shannon Mulcahy Denota from the class of 89, Kelly Robotham from the class of 06, Melissa Verdesia, class of 08, and of course, the one and only, our very special guest, the first and founding dean of, of the dance division at New World School of the Arts, Dr. Danny Lewis, who, who we'll hear from quite a bit in a moment. But uh, a few housekeeping notes for you all as we get started. Uh, this event uh, is being recorded. Uh, please keep your microphones off. For optimal viewing, you can change your uh, viewing to speaker view, and the chat is open. So you guys are welcome to chat it up and certainly ask any questions that you have of anyone through the, uh, through the chat. Tonight is the second installment of an ongoing series of these special events that are being produced by the New World School of the Arts Alumni Foundation. Uh, so be sure to check for more upcoming events on um, our uh, Instagram and Facebook. Both are at NWSA Alumni. Um, so check those out and please open our emails when you get them. We'll be sending emails as well to, uh, to alert you of those upcoming events. So your Alumni Foundation is an independent 501c3 organization. It's run entirely by NWSA alumni for NWSA alumni. And our mission is to provide resources to connect us all and advance each of your personal, professional, and artistic pursuits. Uh, we do this through providing financial grants and support of uh, creative and, and business pursuits, uh, providing college scholarships for graduating NWSA high school seniors, uh, certainly doing events like this and um, setting up mentoring for our alumni and um, for our students by our alumni and much, much more. So please watch what we're doing. We've been very active this year. And we urge you to get involved in one of our many committees. Um, this is what kind of brings our community together. And we'll post a, a link in the chat if you'd like to check out one of those committees. You can also check it out on our bio on social media. And I just also want to thank everyone that donated for tonight's event. We're trying to raise um, an additional $2,500 to fund one of our inspiration grants in 2021. Uh, so we're going to place that link in the chat too, if you wish to donate for that. And um, before I introduce our first moderator, I just want to mention that Dr. Danny Lewis has been the fiscal agent and sponsor for the New World School of the Arts Alumni Foundation from our beginning. And I can honestly say that without his support, we wouldn't be here this evening. So I just want to thank Dr. Lewis for his years of, of help with that. And now I want to turn it over to our first of three moderators, uh, my friend Shannon Mulcahy Denota. Go ahead and take it away, Shannon. I'm going to mute myself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening. It's great to see some familiar faces out there and also to connect with some new faces. That what, that's what this is all about. It is my honor and privilege to um, introduce Danny Lewis, as Patrick said, the founding dean of dance at New World School of the Arts, a post which he held for 24 years. It was his expertise and his vision that helped shape and make the dance department what it is today. Danny is also an internationally known choreographer, performer, educator, and author. His latest book with Donna Krasno is A Life in Choreography and the Art of Dance, which you can check out in the chat, is his story of his journey through his career. So if after tonight you would like to learn a, bit, a little bit more about Danny and check that out, um, you can find out uh, all about his journey through the dance world and as an arts educator. He is truly a generous spirit and a visionary, and he has been one of the inspirations in my life as a dancer. So thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight and welcome Danny, thank you for being here. It's my pleasure to be here. 
So let's, we, we have a lot of questions, so let's get on with our first question. In 1987, you were on faculty and an assistant to the dance director at Juilliard, which was one of the most prestigious schools, is one of the most prestigious schools um, in the country. You left New York, came down to Miami to start an unknown dance program at a brand new art school. What prompted your decision to do that? And if you could tell us a little bit about what the early years were like at New World. Okay. Um, I had no intentions of ever leaving New York. I'm a diehard New Yorker. I had a great job at Juilliard. I had my own dance company. Uh, I was successful. And it was Martha Hill who kept saying to me, she kept trying to send me to Australia. She was a pioneer. She was my mentor for many years. You know, she started NYU, she started the American Dance Festival, she started Juilliard. I mean, she's had careers, she's a really amazing woman. And she kept saying, you have to go somewhere and start something your way. She kept pushing me. Well, Australia was a little too far for me. So when this job come, came up, I said, okay, I'll go audition, I guess the word. I had never auditioned for a, a job in my life, but I was gonna go audition. I get to Miami and I'm interviewed and I go, they tell you, if you had a free trip to Miami, it'd be very nice. I left wanting this position. I looked at what was happening in Miami. The New World Symphony had just started. Uh, uh, Miami City Ballet had just started. This city was ripe to do something and I really wanted the job. Well, I was very lucky that Richard Klein, who was the first provost, Martha Hill recommended me to him. He came over to Juilliard and watched my class. I even gave him a copy of my book I had written. And after the interview, I came back to New York and I hadn't heard anything for a couple of months and I was on my way to London to teach at the London School of the Place. And I got a call from Richard offering me the job. And I said, yes, right off the spot it was. And he said, do you want to think about it? I said, no. <laughs> I wanted the job, and I wanted it because when I was interviewed, I asked people, what kind of dance program do you want? And they would always say, we don't know. We're gonna hire a dean of dance, a dean of theater, a dean of music, and a dean of visual arts to determine what the program should be. How can you turn that down when you're offered a chance to do it your way? Does that answer your question? And you go on to those early days, what happened when I got here? Yes. <laughs> Yes, tell us what it was like, you know, building from the ground up. It, well, it was a shock, let me tell you. <laughs> I, I got here, there was no studio. <laughs> there was a program called Payback prior to this, and we would inherit, I think I inherited 22 or 23, uh, I think they were 10th and 11th graders, I wasn't sure. And they built me a studio in the old Diamond Building, which is now Building 3, the Miami Dade College, and I had two studios, no faculty, no students, and I built a curriculum. And unfortunately, when I first started, we had a principal who had decided that the 10th graders would meet at one time and the 11th, 12th graders another time. And that, and that just did not fit my vision to have all kids of all levels so you can level them out. So you could be a senior in class with freshmen, if ballet was your freshman level, and modern was your different level. So I learned very quickly the power of parents. Actually, I think Richard Klein mentioned to me, talk to the parents, see what you can do. And I talked to the parents, and they went to the principal and complained that I can't do what I'm trying to do. And the principal came to me really annoyed. But in the end, he even said, parents mean a lot in the school system. And he changed it for all four divisions that all the freshmen, sophomores, juniors in the high school met at one time during the day. And then we switched for the college at the other time during the day. And I got what I wanted really early in life. And I have to admit the provost, Richard Klein, was one of the most incredible people I've ever met. His theory was, and I think he's here somewhere. He can correct me if I'm wrong. I think I saw his name pop up. You hire the right people to do the right job, and then you leave them alone to do the job. And he did that with me, which was wonderful. I mean, I just couldn't think of a better way to do it. 
And it, for me, it was so exciting. You know, I went to the high school performing arts in New York, which is where Richard was the principal. And that back when I went, it was a vocational high school. You know, they had woodworking, they had maritime, and now they have this dance theater and visual arts. No music, uh, vi no, visual arts was in another school in the Bronx. Um, I found that that school changed my life. when I went to the high school performing arts, the fame school. I mean, uh, I don't know if you have questions, lady, you wanna know about early. I'm gonna go backwards for a minute. Um, it was difficult growing up in Brooklyn and being a dancer. It was not only difficult, I got beat up, I got cold names. Uh, I was, I think the guys were jealous. The girls always treated me well. But you know, I was very young and uh, carried my dance clothes in an attache case so no one would know I was a dancer. And it was my mom who, when I was in junior high school, I was in the eighth grade. I was asked to be in the senior show at my junior high school and I refused to do it. I was expelled from school for poor citizenship. And it's when I got to the high school performing arts, my mom had me audition and my life changed. All of a sudden I met other artists. I met people who love dance theater and music. I, I met people who actually said to me, that was really good what you did. Before that it wasn't, it was really awful. I led two secret lives. So the thought of starting a high school here in Florida, which would give every child the opportunity to develop themselves as artists or even be exposed to art. They don't have to go on to be an artist as long as they can expose themselves to it, uh, was just so thrilling and so exciting. Because I started, I'm going on and on. I'll get you another question in a minute. I started because I was born with a club foot at age five. And it was a doctor that recommended that I take dance classes to straighten it out. It was my theory at that time that why should a kid have to wait to have a club foot to discover the arts? A kid should have the ability to find it through the public school system. And Miami was ripe for it. The school system had arts in a lot of programs. And I think I'm gonna let you ask another question because I can keep talking for two hours. <laughs> Well, I think that was an excellent way to start. Hello, Danny, and hello, everyone else on the call. We're really excited to be doing this. And so thank you, Danny, for touching upon that and emphasizing how you said LaGuardia, School of the Arts, is what really opened your eyes to the fact that music, dance, theater, all these genres come together and really make you feel like a fulfilled artist. So on that note, you, throughout your career, especially your choreographic career, you've melded together technology within your dance and incorporated other dance disciplines. Can you talk a little bit about those works that you have done that with? And what is the importance of those works when you made them and now going on into this new generation of, of dance? That's a great question. Uh, you know, it's interesting, even while I was at New, even before New World, before everything, I loved gadgets. I built my own record player that played those old um, 45s with a tube. It had an no amplifier, but I made a, I took my mom's sewing needle and put it on an arm, which went through the record and played it through a tube that I made. I, I just loved all that stuff. I brought one of the first tape machines home from Asia when I was at Juilliard and showed it to, um, the people at Juilliard, and they were amazed that these little reel-to-reels actually made sound. What a difference that made for choreographers. And while I was at New World, uh, and we, luckily we had the University of Florida as one of our partners, they had the Digital World Institute, and I did projects with them where we danced in four or five continents at the same time. Uh, we even did some, we got an award, um, I think it was a $25,000 award for having five women sing simultaneously in five continents and be in sync. The University of Florida developed a metronome where it would work and we did it out of our Studio C where the metronome told them when to come in so all five voices could be together. Nowadays, now to get to the real issue, is I've been doing this for years, but now anyone can do it. <laughs> Zoom, which we're on right now, 
you couldn't do back then unless you could afford to have internet too, which is a high speed internet, which cost a lot of money and New World had it back then, we put it in. Um, it's a whole new world now. I've seen some choreography done on Zoom. That's just been wonderful. I mean, what, what kids can do now using technology is amazing. I'm really looking forward to the day where you can get three-dimensional holographs on a stage and a bus driver can come on stage and do the Nutcracker, you know, by wearing his glasses and, and being on the stage. Or he could take a ballerina, throw her in the air, do something else, and then catch her and put her back down again because she's a virtual dancer. And I'm looking forward to how we can combine the virtual and the real at the same time when we get over this COVID stuff. Because now dancers are learning that you can do amazing things with film, with dance. It's really made for that media. So this is a very exciting time coming up. I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Um, speaking of current times right now, um, I am a teaching artist at New World School of the Arts. Dr. Lewis, do you have any advice for anyone who is about to embark on a performing career or continuing a performing career, especially during these times with our pandemic? Okay, well, I'm gonna deal with those separately. First, some advice to anyone studying dance or theater or music or visual arts. Have a dream. We all have these dreams of where we wanna be, what we wanna do. Don't be afraid, along, afraid as you go along that dream and that path to veer off to the right or the left because opportunity knocks all the time. I mean, it's been my life. I've had several careers only because I took a chance and I said, oh, I think I'll go this way, I'll try this. If you stick to a dream and don't allow yourself to go with when the opportunity arises, you'll end up losing. You've got to go with the flow. If you're, yeah, I'll give you an example. I was going to be a Broadway dancer. I was a great hoofer. I've danced with Sam Man Sims. Uh, I only ended up at Juilliard because I, I graduated from high school performing arts. wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life. I'd gotten into anything goes off Broadway as a tap dancer. Uh, Vietnam War was just beginning at that time, and I was about to be drafted. And it was Martha Graham studio, her pianist, who said to me, well, why don't you go to college and get a four year deferment? And by then you can figure out what you want to do with your life. So I went over to Juilliard, I auditioned, I got in. And I must say, in those days, my tuition was $1,300 a year for Juilliard. And I could afford that because I was working in Yiddish theater at the time, or, you know, way down the Lower East Side. And that's where my life changed totally. And modern dance became my joy. So, you know, don't stick to your guns. Don't have a dream and not be willing to change it. The next bit of advice is for the person who's already there and how, what, what should they look forward to in this time of COVID? Well, that's what I was just talking about. It's so exciting. We have new technologies. They're gonna choreograph work that we've never seen before. Uh, we're in a transition period and you should, if you're a dancer now, check the websites all over the world and see who's doing what. There's some incredible stuff coming out of Europe and the United States right now. And boy, I just, I'm thrilled by it all. I think it's gonna make a big difference. Did I answer you? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lewis for that. That's great advice during these times and any time, really. Um, we have a question from uh, an audience member, um, graduated in 1993, Ila Rivera, and she asks, what is your advice for a young dancer who wants to continue on to a dance career and possibly even attend um, New World School of the Arts for dance? And what is the best way to prepare for an audition for New World or say any art school? And what are your, what is your advice with audition techniques for dance in any art form? That's a great question for every kid who wants to be an artist. Uh, first of all, New World, I'll talk about New World first because I know it best. They do, and I think all the disciplines, uh, a mock audition. Make sure you go to it. 
Make sure you pay attention to what's going on around you. Don't let your focus wander at any time during your audition. Keep your focus on the teacher and do exactly what they ask to do and no more. Don't try and impress. Just do what you do. Be yourself. The, the next thing is don't worry about technique when auditioning. Because if you're auditioning for a school, it's their job to teach you the technique. What they're looking for is how good a performer you are. So it's much, much more important to show your performance ability than to show your technical ability. I tell you, we've seen kids come into New World and audition with the greatest technique in the world with a bland face and a bland body. They're doing the mechanics of the ballet and they get rejected. And then they say, oh, but my, my daughter was fabulous. She, she could do 12 pirouettes and she could do this. No, but she wasn't a performer. She didn't, her heart was not coming out. That's what people want to see during an audition. Did I answer it? I talk a lot, so I never know. <laughs> that was perfect, perfect. So speaking of younger artists and dancers, you talk, talked about how you got into dance when you were younger, your time at LaGuardia, but that when you were bullied as a 10 year old boy, if you could go back in time, or not back in time, if you could write a letter now to that 10 year old version of yourself, what would you tell him? Well, it's a very different time than it was back when I was taking class. We're talking about, I took my first class in 1948. It was, it was really a different world. It's much more accepted now uh, as a guy to be in dance, at least in the big cities. If you go into the rural countryside, it's a little different. But the, the best advice is what I did, just to hell with everyone. I'm, this is what I'm doing, you know. But I did cover it up. I told you I carried an attache case. I always wore a tie. Even in, I went, I wore a tie in grade school. You know, sixth grade, I was wearing a tie because I wanted to be a businessman. I wasn't going to be an artist and be ridiculed and beat up. And that's how I looked at it at the time. Uh, I still wear a tie all the time. And this, by the way, was PTSA made this tie for me. It's a dance tie. And I, I have one of the last linging, lingering hats. I don't know if they still make them. They're hard to find. Um, so I'd recommend that just, just say to hell with the rest of the world. This is what I want to do and do it. And it was rough for me because I was doing TV work in the sixth, six, seven, no, in fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade. I was doing these children's shows on Saturday morning. So all these guys saw me on TV and boy, they did not like that. I was ridiculed. I, at one time I was walking down the street and one of the kids grabbed me and he had a split cigar and pushed it behind my ear, you know, and burned me really bad. Uh, I was so happy to get out of Brooklyn uh, and move into the city to the, now it's called LaGuardia with the High School of Performing Arts, where what I was doing was appreciated. Uh, you know, what's his name, the poet, Berlinghetti. I don't know if you guys know him, but if you don't, look him up. He's a fabulous poet, one of my favorites. He once wrote a, a poem called Autobiography. And he said, I once set out to walk around the world and ended up in Brooklyn. The bridge was too much for me. <laughs> and that's exactly what it was like. I left home when I was 14, took an apartment on 72nd Street and Broadway. I was making $60 a week and I'm 14, 15 years old here and supported myself through the high school of performing arts. Uh, and I, I, it was like revelation to be in a place where people understood what you were doing. Uh, so yeah, I tell a kid now, just do it. And I'd also tell them, do it. But if at any point something else comes up, don't be afraid to go because what you've learned as a dancer will apply to anything else you do. I, I tell a story, if you don't mind, I do like to talk a lot about the, the little girl learning creative dance where you melt like an ice cream cone or you tumble like weeds through the desert, you know, like, uh, and at the end of the class, the teacher would always say, um, I'm going to lie down on the floor here by the door. And one by one, I'd like you to run and leap over me. And the kids would love this part of the class. Uh, actually, the teacher who told me the story is the one who set up a 
scholarship at New World for our college kids uh, if they wanted to be teachers. She gave us, I think, $100,000 at the time, which has built up really big. So one day she says to the kids, when you leap over me this time, I want you to scream. And they get all excited, they go scream. They line up and the first little girl walks up to her and says, uh, Miss Rowan, when I scream, do you want me to scream with my voice or with my body? This has taught the kid taking dance classes, how to think outside the box, how to be a creative person, how, how to, to make one and one equal three. And if you can solve those problems, you'll be a better person, a better businessman or a businesswoman. You'd be a good politician. We need a few of those at the moment. Uh, and the arts really teach you to be the best that you can possibly be. Good, your, your microphone is off. Amazing. Um, given the times right now when we are all looking for inspiration or we don't have our in-person live theater performances, do you have anything coming up or in the works for Miami as a community or Miami Dance Futures? Well, Miami Dance Futures does a lot <laughs> all year long. But what is coming up now that I'm real excited by is I'm going to redo a work I did many years ago called No Strings, which is a fantasy work. And I'm gonna do it with masks on and in a, in a cloud situation so that the mask will be made of, painted like a cloud, the costume painted like a cloud. So the dance will take place in the clouds, which is what we're right now, we're in the cloud. So I'm thinking of it as it's sort of like a, a virtual dance, but live on stage. And that's gonna be done in um, April. I don't know the exact date, along with Dance Now Miami. And there's gonna be a book signing at that point at the JCC down in Kendall. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm also looking forward to staging La Malinche, which is a work that Jose Lamon did on Dance Now Miami. And hopefully we have in the plans for the 75th anniversary of the Limon Company, that they're gonna come down here and perform with Dance Now Miami doing the work that I completed. When Jose died, he had just started working on a, the Volstein Sonata. And I completed it at actually five years after, he, no, three years after he died, Juilliard commissioned me to finish the work. And we're gonna do it with the Limon Company. And then we're gonna take Dance Now up to New York to perform it with the loan company up there. And knock on wood, I don't know if I should say this publicly, but we're hoping to do Misa Brevis and augment it with New World dancers and take them to New York as well. Knock on wood, we gotta find the money. That sounds fantastic. Um, and please let everyone know, um, you know, how everyone can stay updated for all these performance. Um, I would love to see anything you're doing up in New York. And um, speaking of your time at the Limone Company, so um, you were a dancer for Limone for many years and um, also directed your own company. What were some, uh, what were your favorite, I should say, what is your favorite moment? I know it'd be hard to pick one, being a dancer and then also being a choreographer? Great question, I've got two great answers. <laughs> As a dancer, there's the most brilliant and wonderful performance I ever did is when I retired. And this was in 72 in Moscow. Uh, Limon, Limon had just passed away and I took the company on the road and we toured uh, Leningrad, Moscow, Kiev, and um, Riga. And so at the last performance, I had taught a class at the Bolshoi Ballet, I taught a class at the Kirov Ballet, and Novosti, which was the press agency back then, I told, I did an interview, and I said, well, this will be my last performance at the Limon Company. I'm retiring. Well, in the Rosetta Theater, which had, I think, almost 4,000 people, I did the Mors Pavan, which is one of Jose Limon's most famous works. I played Iago. We do the performance, and I love doing this piece. The applause went on for a good 35, 40 minutes. 
where the four of us would come out and bow. We'd go back, then one at a time, we'd come out, bow again. we go back, then we come out all together again. Well, this one, I may be exaggerating, it may have been 25 minutes. But what a way to go. And you know, in, in the Soviet Union, then they do rhythmic applause. So it's just boom, boom. And the Mosaic dancers came and the Bolshoi dancers came and they stood around the orchestra pit cheering me on like that. Mm. Well, that was a send off I could never recreate anywhere in the world. And to me, that was a highlight in my performance career. And I did a lot, I can tell you a hundred stories about performances I loved, but that was a very special one because it was my last performance with Bill Mon Company. Although many years later, uh, on the 10th anniversary of Lamont's death, I was asked to recreate a role he taught me at the Joyce Theater in New York. And I said, yes, I'll do it. It was the unsung story of American Indians. I was sitting bull. But I, lack, I did everything I've told a students never to do. I didn't prepare. Really stupid. Uh, the day of the performance, I walked over to the theater because I lived two blocks from the Joyce. And I stood under a hot shower for like 30 minutes till the muscles got really loose. And then Clyde Morgan and I did a, an hour and a half bar, you know, really warmed up. Then I went out on stage and I walked it. I figured if I dance it, I'm gonna hurt myself. And I said, well, I'll get through it one time. No problem, it's a strenuous dance. I mean, leaping and jumping. I did the performance and I was brilliant. And all my Juilliard students who had never seen me perform came. So it was quite an amazing moment. And I get off stage, I couldn't breathe. <laughs> I went, ah! I thought death was imminent. Don't ever do what I did, students. <laughs> I was a jerk. <laughs> I literally, I did everything I told people not to do all my years. But it was a brilliant performance and I enjoyed it. Now you had a second part to that question. The second, yes. And uh, the second part is as a choreographer, do you have a favorite moment as a choreographer? Yeah, I have two works. I've done 32 works, I think it is, 33, I don't remember. Two of them are very special to me. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk about those two for a second. The first one is called, There's Nothing Here of Me But Me. And it's my autobiography. And I really did something strange. The piece starts with the curtain coming up with bright lights, and out walks this woman in a gown and a guy in a, a suit and some other people. There's like a play going on. It's a bow of play and the audience is sitting there going, did we miss the piece? <laughs> what happened? So then they start applauding. And then next thing you know, at the end of the last bow, the house, the house lights go out and the, no, the, the stage lights go out and the work lights come on. And everyone says, oh, great show. And they go walking off on their own. And one dancer is left on stage who reenacts his whole history of his life as a performer. Mm -hmm. At the very end of the dance, all the dancers walk across the stage dressed in street clothes. And they say, oh, good night, Jim. You know, what are you doing here still? You should get, get out. It's really my autobiography and I enjoyed choreographing it. I even enjoy watching it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a great person to watch my own work. The second work I did had to do with my cousin who committed suicide. And I use this really bleak music, Brahms and, and Mahler and so on. And it was a story of a child. Uh, it starts with, it has a lot of text in it. The text that starts at the beginning is, the graves of our children are the best places to hear cries for mercy. And it goes through all these comical things. There are happy moments, there are sad moments. And at the end, she basically strips to a, a a unitard, you know, flesh colored and facing upstage, dives down to the floor and is buried. And it still brings tears to my eyes when I watch it. And everyone that I speak to about it, they say it's probably the greatest work I ever did because it was the most real and moving piece. And boy, when I was young and I said movement was my choice of language, doing that work, I understood how I spoke better than I could have possibly written about this. Yeah. Is there, um, is there any chance of you resetting these works in the future? Yeah, but not, not right now. It's very hard right yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, but yes, uh, and I'm planning on it. 
and Dance Now Miami every year has taken one of my works and it's done them. They did, there's nothing here of me but me. It was two years ago or a year ago. Uh, they're a wonderful company and why I work with them and I like them here is they do the traditional old stuff mm -hmm. and they do the new innovative stuff. Uh, Jose used to say to us, uh, never spit in the face of tradition. Remember <laughs> the old girl was your mother. <laughs> How true that is. So and they really do that. They make sure that people see what had happened. You got to know what's happened before you can go on to something new. So the history of dance, and they do that, and they do such a great job at it. That's fantastic. Well, this, I think, leads to a, a, another great question, so I'll pass it on to our next moderator. Thank you. Yes, Stephanie, and that, those are very wise words. And on the vein of choreography, we have an audience member, Gala Aranaga, who submitted her question. She's from the class of 1988. And her question was, when designing choreography, how do you balance your vision for the collective versus the unique strengths and capabilities of the individual dancer? A great question. <laughs> this, is, this is a difficult one to answer. Uh, when I had my own company, it was easy. I trained those eight dancers. They knew exactly what I wanted. I could give it to them and they did it. They did it the way I wanted it. When I went off to a school somewhere to choreograph a piece, a stage a piece, it was frustrating. They couldn't do it the way I wanted it. Uh, the training is just so important to make it happen. But you can always do a dance with different, you know, let's put it this way. When I get to the school, I'm commissioned to do a new ballet. I get to the school, I don't start choreographing until I've taught them for three days. So I know what their abilities are, how, how the depth of, of their expression is, uh, whether they can really emote, or is it gonna be surface? Um, and you pick your you pick your vocabulary first, and then you choreograph to these dancers or for these dancers. And the, the trick at a school is always to make them look good. And by doing that that way of doing it, but I, I must say, when I stopped my company, I gave up my company to move here. And actually, I still had some grants that we had to fill out when we were here, so we did a couple of performances with it. Uh, I gave up the idea that I can choreograph it the way I wanted it. Well, the nice thing about Dance Now Miami is I've been training those dancers. They take my classes regularly each year, and I can get what I want from them. So it's, it's a whole different ballgame. It is very hard. That's, that's really a good question. Uh, whether you're doing it, well, here, let me, let me go back one step further. I've done some Broadway work, and I hated it because you were doing it for the producers, for what they wanted. I always liked choreographing the way I choreographed, what I wanted to do. Something I learned from Anna Sokolow, very well-known choreographer, who was my resident choreographer for my company, never bend what it is you're trying to say to satisfy someone else. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Um, expanding on your teaching, um, how would you describe your teaching philosophy? What do you think makes a great teacher or educator? And what tips can you give for people interested in pursuing arts education? Another good, you guys come up with good questions. Uh, when I started New World, one of the things I insisted on doing is hiring professional dancers to teach. Not necessarily someone who's just graduated with a MFA in dance, but had no experience on the road. Uh, and I ran into a problem because back in 87, when I started New World, there weren't very many dancers out there who had 10 years of professional experience as an MFA degree. And luckily, Miami-Dade College and the University of Florida gave me some slack. And most of the people I hired had experience. They might have had a BFA or an AA or something like that. And some of them actually went on and earned their BFAs and their masters while teaching at New World. But you can't become a teacher until you've had the experience as a performer. If you haven't had that experience, you don't know the body well enough to disseminate. I know when I started teaching at Juilliard, and I must say I'm an exception to the rule here, Martha Hill hired me to teach the year that I graduated. So I was dancing with the loan company. 
and I was teaching at Juilliard at the same time, I had to figure out a way to take all the knowledge that I had learned from Jose and present it to students so it would make sense. Uh, Peter, Peter London, who teaches at Juilliard, is my student, uh, said it very clearly. He actually wrote a thing in my book um, about how he loved the fact that I broke it down a little bit at a time and he kept adding to it. I called it with Jose Limon's body as an orchestra. You start with the bass, with the ostinato on the legs, the arms become your violins. You figure out how to make one instrument become several instruments so your whole body is the orchestra doing it. And I did all this through finding a center to the body on stage. And I am a great teacher. I'm not proud or anything. Yes, you are a great teacher. I'm gonna pass it back to Shannon. Okay, so moving in a little bit of a different direction, um, talking about supporting yourself as an artist can be challenging, um, especially during these times. You've clearly successfully pivoted into many different roles, not just a performer, but many different other roles. So what can you suggest to artists to, for a creative plan B for moving out of their performing career or in different phases of their lives, being able to change and um, move into different roles such as you have. Okay, this is, this is hard for people now. And uh, you know, I did a fundraiser the other day for my institute, for Miami Dance Futures. And one of the dancers gave me some money and she wrote in, because I had put down that every dollar we raise at this um, fundraiser will go to paying a dancer. And she <laughs> loved that. <laughs> And I believe in it. Most of the grants I get with Miami Dance Futures go to paying dancers and choreographers, sometimes a musician. I don't like paying musicians, but you know, sometimes it goes to them if we commission music. Uh, but dancers need the money. They're probably the least paid group in the arts. And it's terrible because dance was an art form that wasn't recognized years ago when the public school system. Uh, music and visual arts were accepted courses in school. Everyone sang, everyone painted some drawing. Dance came in much later. It was actually Martha Hill who turned the NYU School of Education into an arts program, and dance got out of education. Uh, you know, I don't have the answer here, but I do. I could give you some suggestions. And I said it earlier, too. Don't be afraid to go in the other direction. Don't be afraid to, to take a job as a commercial dancer and earn some money. Doris Humphrey, very well-known choreographer, and Jose used to do Broadway shows. And then Doris say, we have enough money now to rehearse for two months. Let's quit the show and let's go make a piece. Don't be afraid or to go out. You know, actors wait all the time. You see them in restaurants. Do whatever you need to do to make a living. Um, who, what did I do once? Uh, oh, I had, uh, I was broke and someone was having a wedding and wanted me to choreograph something for their wedding. So I did it. You know, I also did some TV commercials and stuff. You do whatever you need to do. I said it earlier, go with the flow. Don't be afraid to change what you're doing. There's nothing wrong with doing something that's commercial. There's nothing wrong with doing something that's totally out of line. And who knows, you could be hired now as a choreographer to work on a video someone's doing. You know how many great choreographers there are doing music videos now? And those things are still being filmed, even with COVID. You know, that's a big business, big industry. Uh, there's a lot of work out there. Don't say, I'm going to be a great modern dancer. I'm going to be the ballerina. You're going to be a dancer, which is what I did at New World. I, did, I took away... You didn't have choices. Even when I went to Juilliard, you could major in ballet, you majored in modern. Uh, later on in life, towards the end of my stay at Juilliard, we sort of merged the two together. And that's what I brought to New World, is you had to take ballet, modern, jazz, Afro, Afro-Caribbean, a little Spanish dance. We did some tap in the high school. I don't think we ever did tap in the college, but we had some great tap dances in the high school. They were fabulous. I'll never forget doing one of our rising stars. And I had like, 20 girls come up and do his tap dance out of the Jarrett Parrot Jungle. And David Lawrence turns to me and says, 
It's amazing. They can all do it. <laughs> you know, it's not that you have one, they can all, they can all do it. And that was the training at New World. It still is the training at New World, that you're a dancer. It doesn't matter what you do. And therefore it opens up a whole market for you. You can get a job doing something else. And there's, a, you know, even the modeling industry, which is huge here in Florida, they hire choreographers to make sure those models walk right. There, there's a lot of work, just mind open as wide as you can. Absolutely. Did you find moving into arts administra administration after being a dancer, because did you just pick up the skills quickly? How, how did that work? Well, that's good. Um, it was easy for me because I ran a dance company. As a dance company, you're an administrator too. You're a choreographer, administrator, and a psychologist all at the same time, <laughs> making sure everyone got along with everyone. Uh, so I had the skills. Mm -hmm. But to tell you how bad administration can be, when I retired, I listed myself as a recovering administrator. <laughs> so I went through 12 steps to get back to being an artist again. Yeah. Because it really stops you from being the artist you want to be. And it took me maybe four years out of New World mm -hmm. to start feeling creative juices that I can start making new work again. It, 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 being an administrator makes you put A following B, follow C. You got to have a certain order to things. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was, I, my creativity as an administrator was in program choosing. Uh, what repertory goes on a program, what choreographers to bring in. That was very exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, bringing technology into New World and I too was very exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, being an administrator. That's called thumbs I think that's how you do it on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> I completely understand. But I was good at it. <laughs> yes, you were. All right, I will pass it on to Melissa. Thank you. So actually, uh, my original question, I'm going to skip it because your answer to Shannon's question really sparked something that has been brought up to me several times lately. And it's about, you mentioned how dancers are, are the least paid or undervalued sometimes. And it's funny because the other day I had a musician friend, a really good friend of mine, who said, hey, I'm, he's part of a band, a Latin band. And he said, do you know any dancers that would be able to do a favor? And I was like, what do you mean? Like, do they they yep. And I go, no. And it's funny, this keeps reoccurring it. And I'm sure it's happened to almost everyone who's watching this. And I want, I want to hear what are your thoughts? Do you think that we as dancers, because we're so eager and we start so young and we'll do whatever to get our foot in the door. Do you think that because we are accepting gigs for little to no money that we have created this societal norm within dance and we ourselves are undervaluing us. And yep. how can we break that mindset so that we are paid as much as a musician or an actor or a visual artist? You hit a sore point in my life. I mean, I did a lot of crap. You know, I did weddings, I danced at weddings, but I always said I get paid. And I, I knew exactly how much I wanted. And back then it was $60 a performance. If I went in for a wedding and back in the 50s, $60 was a lot of money. My dad earned $60 a week and raised a family of five. And I would not do a performance for less than $60. When I first started with the Lamone Company, AGMA, I'm still a member of AGMA, American Guild of Musical Artists. I don't, I don't do anything, but I still a member because I believe in what they do. They fight for dancers. They make sure that we get paid for what we're worth. But back when I was first dancing with the Lamone Company in 1963, the running wage for a dancer was $32.50 a performance. The running wage for a musician was three times that. So it took some major fighting with the union and reps to get, the, and they're pretty good now. If you're a, a union dancer, you get paid the decent wage along with the musician. But the attitude that this band has, do me a favor and dance for me, it's sort of meaningless. You just say no, you get paid. It's as simple as that. Amazing answer. Um, Dr. Lewis, you have been a trailblazer for decades. Um, 
across the world and especially in Miami, but looking at all of the generations of dancers that you've seen, educators that have, were your students that became dancers, where do you see Miami as a dance community in the future? Where do you see um, the like, dance companies flourishing? Where do you, I think that we have such a great training base um, that we should have more dance companies in Miami. Um, where do you see the future of dance in Miami we, right we now? We have quite a few. When you consider when I first got here, there was three or four. I won't mention any names right now. But now there are quite a few. Rosie Herrera has a company, Dance Now, uh, Pioneer Winter. Uh, they, I can go on, I probably list, when I do the dance sampler each year, we put out a call for works. And I'd say a good 20 to 25 dance companies here that apply to be on the program. Um, so yeah, it's, I think we're at a stage and I'm, I've got to throw out a moment here for the uh, Metro Dade Arts Council. They have made a major difference to the arts in this city. They've really put, they've made dance grow faster than it could have in any other city. Um, uh, it's a hard call. They say it takes 10 years to make things happen. And Miami City Ballet is now 30 years old. So the modern dance field was like 20 years behind that catching up. And modern dance companies will never be uh, big like a ballet company. It just, it's not the way the structure works because most modern companies are based on one choreographer's movement, one choreographer's things. It's, it's what I, when I did my um, first company, I didn't even call it the Daniel Lewis Dance Company. I called it Contemporary Dance System because I did Anna Sucklow's work, Jose's work, my work, company members' works. Uh, it was a whole different bag. It was like a repertory company. And even when I wrote my book this year with Donna Krasnow, who I think is online here, she might want to say something about this or ask a question. Uh, I didn't want a biography. I didn't want an autobiography. I wanted a history of my life through dance, which is what the way the book is written. Uh, and Donna was really amenable to that and did a great job taking the different facets of my life because they overlap so much. It's, it's hard to clearly put anything chronological. Uh, this city is ripe. It's been ripe, it's still ripe, but modern dance companies will never grow to the big name like the ballet companies are. They just don't have that infrastructure because they're a one choreographer company. It's what made Ailey so famous. They're a repertory company. They do lots of people. I even staged Misa Brevis on the Ailey company years ago. Alvin had a vision of repertory, not just him. And maybe someday we'll end up here with, if they can make it happen, a repertory company. I think Dance Now has come as close to it as possible. They're bringing in choreographers to do things. Once it becomes a repertory company and starts getting the financial backing for it, it could be successful in that sense that you're asking about how, how it can grow, where they can start paying dancers salaries instead of fees. Good, I hope that answered your question. Thank you. And speaking of your biography, um, we would like to know what inspired you to um, write this book with Donna Krasnow. And uh, just to remind everybody, the link for the book is uh, in the chat. Well, for years I wanted to write my biography only because I knew people. I mean, I was lucky. I, I met Martha Hill and she took me under her wings. I met Jose Limon, he took me under his wings. I met Anna Succolo, she took me. I had this personality. I think it was the fact that I wasn't uh, impressed by what they were doing maybe. I was just the every average day Joe. No, yeah, I'll work with you. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story about how I got in the Limon company. I was standing by the elevator at Juilliard and when I stand by elevators, I don't know, some of you, some of you may know it here, I always tap dance. I've had New World kids say, you can dance, Dean Lewis? <laughs> yeah. I say, yeah, I could dance. How do you get the job? <laughs> but I, I, I'm just, you know, in a little nervous habit, I tap dance. I love tap dancing. So I'm standing by the elevator doing my little tap dance with Julia, and Jose Limon's standing next to me, and he says, how would you like to go to Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Australia, um, 
and starts listing uh, all these places. And I looked at him, I said, sure, you know, at 18, anyone offers you to go anywhere in the world, I'll go. Never heard another word about it for months. And then somewhere around April or May, I got a phone call from management saying to come sign some contracts. And next thing I knew, I was rehearsing with the Lamont Company in my first year at the Juilliard School. That summer at 18, we opened up Lincoln Center. They had the first theater at Lincoln Center. It was called the Philharmonic Hall back then. I think now it's Avery Fisher Hall. But we performed there to open it up. And I did a solo in Visa Brevis, which is why that work is always in the back of my mind is the first work I did of those days. Um, and I just assume that's normal. That happens to everyone. And my life has been that way. I'd be in the right place at the right time with the right talent. And when I look back at my life and all the people that affected, all the people that affected me, I wanted to tell a history. What I really wanted was a history book, but Donna said, no, this should be a, a biography. She was, she really had a great vision to how to make it work. Um, and it works. It's, it's a good book. It really tells the history. Uh, who was it? Um, uh, oh, wait, I got to look. It was, it was, oh, here it is. Uh, Jennifer Dunning, dance critic of the New York Times who's reviewed my company millions of times. I'm gonna quote it, if you don't mind, can I read it? Written by one of the great multitaskers of American modern dance, this book is a unique blend of autobiography and the recent dance history, which is exactly what I wanted. I wanted a history book that told it through my eyes of my life story. And we got it, it's doing real well. Yes. Well, I enjoyed reading it very much. And I learned so much about you that I didn't know. So I highly recommend it. I will pass the mic on to Melissa. Yes, I, I have not read it yet, but I'm really excited to. And we're coming close to our, our finishing time. So I want to go ahead and ask you one final question. And that is, how do you think the voices in dance have changed throughout the generations? And where do you think this, this voice is going? Where is it going? That's going to take me a couple hours to, to answer, but I'll try, I'll try and get it in two minutes. <laughs> um, there's a difference between voice and what people are choreographing. Because the voice is the, the, mo is the motivation for the work. And then the steps are something else. And steps have changed through time. We've gone through the hip hop eras, the, this era, that era. Um, I think what's more important is that people have more to say now than they've had in the past. You know, in the 70s, they weren't saying much. It was dancing, everyone had a great time. Uh, the Judson era, they were saying a lot. Uh, with the minimalism, they were really making statements. We're back to making statements, I think, again now, because of what the world's going through, both politically and with the COVID-19. So I think we're going to see a whole new voice. The voice is very important. It's what I liked about Rosie Herrera. When she graduated from New World, I said, she's going to have a Miami voice. She's going to have something so different and so special. And she did, she's doing real well. So someone I love dearly, I love her work. So yeah, there's gonna be new voices coming. And that gets me very excited. That makes me wanna to go to a concert. That makes me wanna see something. Although I gotta got have one thing, a couple of months ago, things two months ago, I hadn't seen a live performance since more, more time than I can think of. Uh, and I went out to the Jackie Gleason Theater, the ballet, Hispanic Ballet, it gave me my fifth Lifetime Achievement Award. And they did a live performance, no audience, but there was a live performance on stage. And I'm standing in the wings with tears coming out of my eyes to see the human body sweating again, to see the human body working. And that's why I think if we can get that human body back into the technology that's happening with all the Zoom stuff, we're going to have something so new and a new voice that's going to be a universal voice because everyone around the country and around the world is going through this new technology stuff. So it's a very exciting time. For sure. And I think I can say on behalf of everyone on this call that we're eager for that day to come. 
But on that note, I want to thank you, Danny, on behalf of all the moderators and everyone who planned this, Amy, Patrick, thank you for your candidness and your generosity and just for being such a, a pivotal part of our dance journeys and the journey of so many young children and artists. So thank you for that. It's my pleasure. It's what I love. So I'm going to pass it along to Patrick. Take it away. Thank you so much, Melissa. I'll just hop in quickly and just thank you. And of course, Shannon and Kelly for providing such a great program for us this evening. And Dr. Lewis, it's been such a pleasure. Uh, we've known each other for such a long time. And it, 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 I'm always amazed at, at all the new things that I learn when I, when I hear you speak about your life, your lifelong journey in, in the arts. It's really inspiring um, for me and I'm sure for everybody uh, this evening. So. I want to take just a quick moment and mention one more thing about your Alumni Foundation. Uh, the Board of Directors of the Alumni Foundation has pledged $8,500 in a, in a matching campaign challenge for all of our members between now and the end of the year. So you're going to start hearing about that tomorrow through social media and email. So think about that. Uh, we'd love to have the rest of our membership help match our Board of Directors pledge of $8,500. So check that out. Um, we're going to leave the chat and leave the program open for a while. Dr. Lewis, I hope that's okay. You, you want to hang I'll around for a few minutes? For a few minutes. Yeah. If you could. And I think with that, we're closing the program. We're just going to kind of leave it, leave it open and let folks kind of chat between themselves, either through the chat or with your mics on, however you would like to do it. So thank you all so much. A wonderful, wonderful installment. Happy holidays to all, and please look for some more programming coming up in January. So thanks. Good, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Hey, Donna, can you hear me? Put on your microphone. I can hear you. Yes. <laughs> that was Donna, great. Donna did a great job with my book. Four, but, four and a half years. I mean, we yeah, four and a half years. But we did have some amazing times. I mean, it was, it it was a huge mm -hmm. journey together and a huge event, but quite wonderful to go through all those boxes of archives and hear all your stories. It was just fabulous. Yeah, but now I, I quiz people. If there's anyone there that read my book, um, when was I knighted and where? I'm a royal knight. <laughs> That's I read your book. That's great. Yeah, yeah Richard, you read it. Yeah, you're you're nice. Well, good night. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's it's just a, a little mention in the book that I was knighted by Prince Sihanouk in Cambodia in oh, 1963. Yeah. That was a great trip. It was a fabulous trip. Yes. Yeah. We enjoyed this conversation. You were really wonderful. Well, I enjoy talking. I'm a good storyteller. Yeah. Who doesn't have the book? It's so, I mean, you, you just have to, it's a page turner because you want to see, and then what happened when he went there or here? And it was great. It was great. The story about Russia was wonderful. Your final performance. That yeah. was very, very interesting. That was a very important performance for me. You did a good job, Danny. Thank you. Well, as, as the moderator, you brought me here, Richard. That was fun. Anyone have any questions? I could still answer something. They're going to leave us on for a few minutes. I'd love to hear about your time in the Yiddish theater. Okay, that, that's, a great that's in the book, too. <laughs> I need to get the book. I, I you did must Yiddish the theater book. all the way through high school. I would do, we would learn a new show on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We did the show on Friday, one show, three on Saturday, two on Sunday. We had Monday off. We learned a new show on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night, which is why I took an apartment in New York at age 14. So I didn't have to travel to Brooklyn all the time. Uh, but I never told my parents. I told them I was living with friends. And one day I was at home and I said with my parents, I said, oh, I got to go home now. 
and I'll never, I can still hear my mom. <laughs> Home? <laughs> she was, what? She, she had a perplexion that was unbelievable. My dad said, oh, I'm proud of you, boy. <laughs> Mom had a touch. One, one less mouth to feed. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> how true it is. But doing Yiddish theater really taught me how to be a choreographer. They knew how to capture an audience. They knew how to just make a skit last just enough time to throw the punchline at people. Uh, it, you know, they, it was a wonder. It was, Yiddish theater was the predecessor to vaudeville. Mm. Uh, and they knew theater, they knew audiences better than anyone I knew. And I've worked with some of the greats, Molly Pecan, uh, what was his name? Uh, I can't think of them now, but some of the really great Yiddish theater or vaudeville people. And we did a new show every week. And then we would take it for the holidays, we'd take it up to Canada and do it up there. Uh, this is a Borch circuit? I spoke, I did, well, no, we didn't do the, I, we did a little bit of the Borch circuit, not much, because this was really theater, you know, in, in major theaters. Uh, but what's amazing about it is that I learned Yiddish to act in it and dance. I had no idea what I was saying. Wow. I still call you Dean Lewis, but I'm getting used to Dr. Lewis. <laughs> and now that, I'm, now that I'm teaching at New World, I just want to say thank you for all of the years. Um, it's amazing to come full circle and walk the hallways now as faculty. But what made you want to leave? What made you want to leave New World at the time that you did? Well, it, it's, it's a very simple thing. It's called retirement. You, you go through so much, and it was also time for a new person to come in and do something. And there was another motivation in the state. If you retire at a certain age, you get these huge bonuses. So, you know, you take it. And I had done it long enough, 24 years. I'm the only dean that made it through 24 years. Uh, everyone else, they, like, music had many deans. Uh, <laughs> theater had a few. Visual arts had a few, but I made it all the way from birth to retirement. And I was ready to retire. Administration. I wanted to come back to being an artist. I also yeah. wanted a little more time with my son, but by then he was in high school and wanted nothing to do with me. <laughs> yeah, you're still very busy. I see you at um, almost every event that has dance attached to it, you're always there in the shadows. So thank and you for still being present even though you're retired. I'm, I'm the most unretired, retired person. <laughs> Good, anyone else have a question? Remain that way, please. Yeah, I will. <laughs> it also keeps me alive. Um, it, what, you, what you have done for the world of dance in Miami and Florida and the whole oh, all over. Oh, you can't retire. You will not you will not be allowed to. There's no such thing. <laughs> I'm waiting for the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else any other questions or is it time to say good night? Oh, well, uh, sorry. I just had a question. Hi, I'm Simone. Um I'm Shannon's daughter. Um, oh hey, Shannon's daughter. Do you have a name? Um, my name's Simone. Um, I just had a question. So I, um, I do theater and I also do tap dancing. So I was just wondering what your best advice is for artists who may not attend an art school. Um, just like how should they balance being involved in arts inside their school community and outside of their school community? And like, um, yeah, how do you recommend um, that they stay involved in the arts as best as possible, balancing those two kind of it, things? It's create your own thing start something after school, be, be the um, innovator. Find a, a few other kids that like to do something, get together and just jam it. Okay, thank you. Good, is that Ava there? Hi hey, Danny, how, how are, are you? you? Yes. Yeah, hi, how are you? Good, this is a relative. Yeah, <laughs> it's so good to, to see you and to hear about this. Yeah. I also haven't, haven't read the book yet, but I'm I'm very excited too, and it was nice to get this this uh, 
taste of taste of what I might what I might learn. Yeah, Ava is the daughter of my cousin, and we don't know each other really very well. No, either. no, yeah, but we I had hope actually planned on having lunch together back when COVID happened, and we had to cancel it, and that would have been our first meeting. I, I met you when you were like three years old. Yeah, right. Seen. But I see Arlene there too. Hey, Danny, so great to see you. Thank you for doing this. That was my pleasure. Yeah, you, you were a very important part of the beginning of uh, New World. And you, uh, I, the first day I met you, you tap danced your way into our hearts. <laughs> <laughs> first New World faculty introduction, yeah. So do you remember I showed the movie of Kukul, Fran, and Ollie? I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful film someday, if you could see it. It's Kukler and Ollie, which are puppeteers back in my days, debating which is more meaningful, the ballet or the modern dance. <laughs> it's a very funny film. Hi, Laura. You made a big impression on us. Yes. yes but... Anyone else have a, a, a question or if you want to make a donation, the alumni association? I think there was one question in the chat by uh, Garrett Coleman. Um, he says, Dr. Lewis, thank you so much for your wise words. Just a quick question. In your opinion, what is the role of the artist slash choreographer during this unprecedented period of transformation and change in our society? That, that is a great question. And you do have a job. It's to hold a country together. I remember when India and Pakistan went to war when I was a kid. And to me, that was weird, you know, countries going to war. I think I, I don't remember the year, but I was very impressed by Mrs. Gandhi, who I heard speak on television or radio, I don't remember what it was, but she said she called upon the businessmen not to take advantage of this and make money. She called about, upon the bankers to make sure that the country was stable financially. And she called upon the artists to hold the country together during this troubling time. And arts do keep people together. So the arts are very important to our culture. I never understood why these politicians, the first thing they cut in the school system was the arts. When the arts make kids learn better, it's been proven. Danny, that's such an important message. And if it's okay, I, I think we'd like to leave it there. I've been asked to go ahead and, and close things out for the evening, but um, it's been such a pleasure and, and I'm sure that, that this is such a wonderful small group and we could sit and chat all evening, but, but I know our producers have, have to move on to some other things this evening. So if I might just uh, close out the evening and encourage all of you to please get Danny's book. And Danny, if, if they shoot you a little message, would you maybe sign a copy for people? All they need to do is contact me. Let me give them an email address. If you would, please. It's do it to Dan Dance, D A N D A N C E, the number one at BillSouth.net. And if any of you didn't get that, you can certainly reach out to the Alumni Foundation and we will provide or just, it. Or just go to my page, my the Daniel Lewis Dance.com page. It's on there. Write to me, and then you can always just tell me you, you've got a book and you'd like me to sign it. Stop by. Uh, I'd love to do that for you. Thank you so much. So with that, everyone, have a wonderful evening. So great to see you all. Happy holidays again. And uh, hope Thank to see you, you next month. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye.